Coast Guard Agency has just been amended and it has just been published under a new version, a version less than a month ago, in November this year. And I'm going to show you that new legislation. There you go. On the screen you can now see the new regulation of 13th November 2019. So this is really fresh from the oven, huh? if you like. Um, on the European border and coast guard and repealing the previous versions of the law. Okay? This law is some 100 30 pages long. It's a very detailed law. Actually, as a point of interest, it was a Maltese MEP who was responsible for this law in the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola. It's a very detailed law and it has taken uh, Frontex to a new level as more of an operational agency with, wait for it, the possibility to have its own assets that is to say, purchase vessels, purchase planes with its own budget to do that, obviously from the EU budget, and including with its own personnel. And until, I believe, 20, uh, 2022, we'll check that in a minute, the personnel of the agency plus personnel added seconded to it by the member states, when I say personnel, I mean border guards, eh, clearly, will add up to 10,000. So this, this, this agency has grown exponentially, exponentially. And it has grown in parallel with these developments that have been taking place. So, we are moving to a situation which is here different from Europol. I just told you a few minutes ago, ah, but Europol does not have its own police officers. In the case of Frontex, it is gradually starting to recruit its own officers who would be European border guards. And uh, that number will go up to 10,000 in a matter of a few years. And I think that table is here. By 2027, as you can see on the board, on the, on the monitor, the number will be 10,000. Um, uh, it will consist of 3,000 staff of the agency, 1,500 staff seconded on a long-term basis to the agency. Can you see the, the categories, the, the columns? Uh, 5,500 in category 3 of staff on a short-term basis. Okay, so there will be a mix of people, people employed permanently with the agency, so its own officials, who would be available for immediate uh, dispatch, okay, in different zones where support of Frontex is required, be it a land border, be it airports, be it sea borders, which are the most tricky for obvious reasons. Um, uh, and by 2027, that total will be 10,000. Concretely, the missions of Frontex in hotspots would be missions, until now, of experts. Okay? Uh, but, increasingly, they will be missions of actual border guards. Who would be available? Now, will they replace national border guards? They will work alongside them, um, but clearly the number indicates that Frontex, or as it is now called the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, 
will have its own personnel, uh, although half of it will be actually seconded from the member states. If we had to look at this summary of what this new um, um, regulation features, it is a reliable intervention force which will go up to 10,000 by 2020. This summary is one year old. In fact, as we've just seen a while ago in the final uh, law that was adopted, that 2020 has gone up to 2027. Uh, expanded tasks and powers of the agency and also um, its own equipment. Uh, the Commission has earmarked, I'm reading here, 2.2 billion until 2027 to allow the agency not only to acquire but also to maintain and operate the air, maritime and land assets needed for its operation. And this obviously is reflected in the founding legislation. Huh? This is why I'm explaining all this to you. So those of you who are interested in this agency, there you are. You have a regulation that has just come out freshly from a new agreement, taking it to a new level with new functions, with new powers, with new assets, with added budgets. Any questions on Frontex? Okay. Well, that said, let us now go to the main subject of our lecture today, which is the European Asylum Support Office. The European Asylum Support Office was set up by Regulation 439 of 2010. There was an intense competition as to who uh, is going to host it, and Malta, after losing out <laughs> on Frontex, was banging its fists on the table that this time round, on a subject so important for us, you really need to. And sure enough, Malta garnered the support that was necessary to host this agency, which started off as an office, as a, let's say, a tiny office but which, as we shall see, is growing exponentially and is expected to increase even its staff to around 500 officials in the coming years, in the near future, as we shall see. Because there is a proposal to change this regulation still uh, on the table. Okay? Now, let's have a close look at the, um, uh, at the regulation. You know by now very well that the regulation is divided in two parts. A part where we have the preambles and the part where we have the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the operative part. And that's where we will go to. From the preamble, I would last just like to point you to paragraph 14, and I'm enlarging it on the screen. I'm pointing you to this because it immediately puts us in the right perspective as to what the agency can and cannot do. Okay? So, the support office should have, EASO, should have no direct or indirect powers in relation to the taking of decisions by member states, asylum authorities on individual <laughs> applications for international protection. Who is going to tell me what this means? So the support office, uh, support office does not have any discussion regarding the procedure, the type of um, quali qualities that are, regarded, um, that are required for asylum seekers to be granted international protection. Precisely. The EASO, they're making it clear, we're going to set up an office, but hey, 
the decision on whether to grant international protection remains in the hands of member states. Why do you think that they wanted to include this reference? Because it lies in the discussion of the member states and not in the public. Because the member states are very jealous of this issue. We're talking about a very controversial and sensitive issue. How many foreigners come into the EU territory, come into our country, even if they apply for international protection. Who is going to decide whether they qualify for international protection or not? Okay? Uh, allow me, uh, I need to switch this off to avoid that sort of noise. Okay, so uh, yes, you are right, and the reason is that member states do not want uh, to give up their power to the, take those decisions. Now, let's immediately go to the operative part of the regulation, which establishes, as you can see on the screen, the uh, um, uh, European Asylum Support Office, I emphasize the need to underline the word office. It immediately sends us the message that this is not an executive office. It will not tell member states what to do. It will not decide for member states. It will simply coordinate and support the existing efforts of the member states. So, a European Asylum Support Office is hereby established in order to help and immediately from the first paragraph we can glean, we can understand the main three functions of this agency which I have tried to highlight um, uh, uh, in different colors ending up with the paragraph looking like uh, um, uh, uh, the flag of, of, uh, of uh, LGBTI um, uh, uh, which is fine improve the implementation of the common European asylum s system. Okay, I'm going to see this one by one. Um, uh, strengthen practical cooperation among member states on asylum. And uh, provide and or coordinate the provisional, the provision, excuse me, of operational support to member states subject to particular pressure. So already we start getting an idea of what we're talking about here. Okay? You see, in the first paragraph, it already gives us an idea of what it wants to achieve, which is, let's improve the implementation of the CEAS, the Common European Asylum System, per being, Sorry. The common European asylum system being uh, improve the implementation of the common European asylum system being this package of laws that we mentioned last week consisting of different laws in the area of asylum ranging, ranging from the Dublin regulation to the qualification uh, directive to the procedures directive, to the reception directive, to Eurodac, and indeed even EASO is part of that package of legislation. We remember when I told you that this package <coughs> has not been changed because although they agreed on everything, they didn't agree on Dublin changes? Well, EASO is stuck in that problem. They want to change this agent, the, this office, and turn it into an agency, but it's still stuck, it, stuck in the ongoing negotiations. Okay, so the Common European Asylum System is the system of EU law in the area of asylum, and agencies and all the support, uh, supporting policies um, uh, that have been established in this area. Okay, very good. Good. So, improve its implementation is number one. Number two is strengthen the practical cooperation among member states. Get member states to work together in this area. Okay? For example, one thing that is really bizarre is the rates of approval 
are different. True.